The Philosophy of Tolkien The World View Behind the Lord of the Rings Section 7 Philosophy of History Section 7 One is history a story? Probably the most important question in the philosophy of history is whether history is teleological, that is, purposive, providential, plotted, planned, or predestined. Is it a story, with a meaning, or is it just one damn thing after another? To see the difference, contrast two famous poetic expressions of the two opposite answers. One is the Hobbit's humble walking song, Lord of the Rings, page 72, which sees life, the life of the individual, of the community, and of the larger community of communities that is the world, as a road, that goes ever on and on, that has an objective nature and meaning and direction of its own, and presents to us tasks so that I must follow if I can even though we know little and cannot say the future. The opposite philosophy is that history is no story at all. That is Macbeth's philosophy of history. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day. To the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools. The way to dusty death. Out. Out. Brief candle. Lives but a walking shadow a poor player, that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale, told by an idiot, full of sound and fury. Signifying nothing, Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5. This is Hell's philosophy of history, for Macbeth is a damned soul, and he is already seeing life as the damned see it. Once, when our civilization believed in gods, Zeus, Jupiter, J.H.W.H., Jesus, we understood our history to be part of a grand story. We pitied poor damned souls like Macbeth and wrote cautionary tales about them, like Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. But our culture has turned inside out, so that it is no longer on the outside of Macbeth, looking in at him with pity and terror, but inside of Macbeth's mind, looking out at a world as objectively meaningless as his, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And because our culture is thus not looking at Macbeth but looking along him, to U.C.S. Lewis's distinction, see pages 124, 25, it is not writing moralistic plays like Shakespeare's, but naturalistic novels like Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, showing what life looks like when its teleological frame is removed. Gouda also does this in his great revision of the Faust story by transforming Faust from a damned villain into a clever hero by transforming the Christian god of moral goodness into the pantheistic god beyond good and evil, and by transforming the devil from God's enemy and Faust's terror into God's own dark side and half of Faust's fulfillment. Myth and fantasy show us the significance of our lives, and, when done on a large and epic scale, of our history. By not showing us particular historical facts that we all know, a fantasy like the Lord of the Rings shows us more clearly the grander universal truth that we have forgotten, the truth that these particulars form a meaningful pattern, like threads on the back of the tapestry, deliberately, not randomly, arranged. What greater service could literature perform for us than that? What mythic search is greater than man's search for meaning? What issue is more momentous than whether history is chance or the dance? When we see our lives from this higher point of view, we share in a tiny bit of God's mind. That is ultimately why we love literature, according to Tolkien. If lit. teaches us anything at all, it is this, that we have in us an eternal element, free from care and fear, which can survey the things that in life we call evil with serenity, that is not without appreciating their, evil, quality, but without any disturbance of our spiritual equilibrium. Not in the same way, but in some such way, we shall all doubtless survey our own story when we know it, and a great deal more of the whole story. Letters, number. 94, pages. 106, 107. C.S. Lewis points out that the single most important question in morality, in ethics, is really this question in the philosophy of history, the question of the meaning of life. Think of us as a fleet of ships sailing in formation. The voyage will be a success only. In the first place, if the ships do not collide and get in one another way, and, secondly, if each ship is seaworthy and has her engines in good order. 
But there is one thing we have not yet taken into account. We have not asked where the fleet is trying to get to. However well the fleet sailed, its voyage would be a failure if it were meant to reach New York and actually arrived in Calcutta. Morality, then, seems to be concerned with three things. Fiercely, with fair play and harmony between individuals. Secondly, with what might be called tidying up or harmonizing the things inside each individual. Thirdly, with the general purpose of human life as a whole, what man was made for, what course the whole fleet ought to be on. You may have noticed that modern people are nearly always thinking about the first thing and forgetting the other two, mere Christianity, pages. 70, 71. It is this universal meaning in life and history that gives maximal value to the life of the individual. If individuals live only 70 years, then a state, or a nation, or a civilization, which may last for a thousand years, is more important than an individual. But if Christianity is true, then the individual is not only more important but incomparably more important, for he is everlasting in the life of a state or a civilization, compared with his, is only a moment. Ibid, p. 73. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them, that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a net. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Section 7.2 is the past, tradition, a prison or a lighthouse? Humility entails learning from others. Learning from others entails respect for tradition, for tradition is simply learning from dead others. As Chesterton famously said, tradition is the democracy of the dead. The two commonest alternatives in the philosophy of history are traditionalism or radicalism, conservatism or progressivism, to focus primary attention on learning from the past or planning for the future. Tolkien is a conservative. All pre-modern societies were. Perhaps most of the masses in many modern societies still are. Their common sense will not let them believe that it is more important to invent new things than to use and enjoy the ones we already have. Most people are bourgeois, most people are hobbits, most people are conservatives. But the teachers, the intellectuals, are massively progressives. That is part of the reason for Tolkien's great unpopularity among the critics and his great popularity among their pupils, the masses, who have been deprived of this gospel of the goodness of tradition by their teachers. There are many meanings to the concept modern, but common to all of them is the opposition to tradition, the sense that the wisdom of the past has dissipated like a rainbow, the sense that, as Karl Marx put it, all that is solid melts into air. Tolkien refutes this with a book that makes even its critics marvel at the solidity of Middle Earth and of its history and traditions. The basic argument for tradition is simply that it works. It works in the Lord of the Rings. Over and over again. There are many close calls and dangerous turns in the plot, and most of them would not have been negotiated successfully if the protagonists had not known and followed tradition. They remember something their enemies forget. It is almost always words. Often it is a proverb or riddle or a poem. To a culture that scorned tradition, Tolkien offers an epic that exalts linguistic traditions, which were not only his professional specialty, but his love. There are more than 500 references in The Lord of the Rings to the past two ages of Middle-earth. Clyde Kilby counts 600 in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit together. Tolkien's heroes are humble and therefore look to the past, to the wisdom they had been given. His villains and fools are proud and therefore scorn tradition and look only within themselves for their wisdom. Tolkien is implicitly asking his readers, his culture, 
to remember their links with their own ancient wisdoms, pagan, Jewish, and Christian. Few lessons, however indirectly taught, could be more socially relevant than this one, for tradition means linking, unifying over time, and no community can exist without common unity over time as well as place. A generation gap destroys a community more surely than a war. Most people are traditionalists and thus sympathize with a passage like this. The notion that motor cars are more alive than, say, centaurs or dragons is curious, that they are more real than, say, horses is pathetically absurd. I do not think that the reader or the maker of fairy stories need ever be ashamed of the escape of archaism. For it is after all possible for a rational man, after reflection, to arrive at the condemnation of progressive things like factories, or the machine guns and bombs that appear to be their most natural and inevitable, dare we say inexorable, products, on fairy stories, pages. 80, 82. C.S. Lewis too was a conservative and called progressivism the vulgarest of all vulgar errors, that of idolizing as the goddess history what manlier ages belabored as the strumpet fortune. Progressivism is chronological snobbery, he wrote. The uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date is on that account discredited. You must find why it went out of date. Was it ever refuted, and if so by whom, where, and how conclusively, or did it merely die away as fashions do? If the latter, this tells us nothing about its truth or falsehood, surprised by joy, pages 207-208. Progressivism is arrogant, for we know the past far better than we know the future, we have no notion. What stage in the journey we have reached? Are we in Act 1 or Act 5? Are our present diseases those of childhood or senility? A story is precisely the sort of thing that cannot be understood until you have heard the whole of it, Christian Reflections, page 106. Tolkien's traditionalism, with all its dependence on the past, does not make the mistake of ignoring the future. In fact, the main reason for tradition is to guide the future. It is not even accurate to say that Tolkien's heroes balance their traditionalism with a sense of responsibility for the future, as if the two things were opposites. For listening to the past and responsibility for the future are two sides of the same coin. Section 7.3 is history predictable? Tolkien is not a progressivist, but he does not embrace the opposite terror either, the notion that there is nothing new under the sun, that history is a set of unending and unchangeable cycles of doom. That was the standard pagan philosophy of history as fate. Tolkien's Christian philosophy of history avoids both the false pessimism of pre-Christian paganism and the false optimism of post-Christian humanism. Tolkien mentions the importance of individual acts as one of the Lord of the Rings' major themes. The place in world politics of the unforeseen and unforeseeable acts of will, and deeds of virtue the apparently small, ungreat, forgotten in the places of the wise and great, good as well as evil. A moral of the whole is the obvious one that without the high and noble the simple and vulgar is utterly mean, and without the simple and ordinary the noble and heroic is meaningless, Letters, number. 131, page. 160. In the Christian philosophy of history there are things that are genuinely new because there is a God above time who can alter history. God says, Behold, I am doing a new thing, is 43 hours 19 minutes. History does not simply repeat itself, and the future cannot be predicted. Paganism tried to understand history in terms of the cycles of nature but the Bible understands nature in terms of history, as the setting for the drama between man and God and between man and man. Tom Bombadil shows the relation between nature and history in Tolkien. Tom seems to be a personification of nature, or a nature spirit. He is probably all, the angel of the earth. In contrast, the rain itself is a historical being. It is a product of historical purpose and action and its meaning is a historical meaning. In some way he, Bombadil, represents nature, and Tolkien uses him to identify the essentially historical by contrast. Tom asked about the ring, but did not seem to take it very seriously, moreover, it had no power over him. It did not make him invisible, 
and, when Frodo put it on, Tom could still see him. The affair of the ring was history, and Tom's was not a historical existence. At the Council of Elrond one of the elves suggested that they ask Tom Bombadil to take the ring and hide it in the old forest. Gandalf answered that, if Tom could be persuaded to, he would not understand the need and would soon forget it or even more likely throw it away. Such things have no hold on his mind. Glorifindel said, I think that in the end, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall, last as he was first, and then night will come. I, 279. Glorifindel, it should be noted, did not predict such an outcome, the council did not despair. But historical decision is ultimately what determines nature and not the other way round. In Tolkien's monotheistic world, the mysterious authority which is in control of history is one for whom nature itself is a historical act. The theological basis for this is the difference between men and angels. The dealings of the Aenor have indeed been mostly with the elves, for Elevatar made them more like in nature to the Aenor, though less in might and stature, whereas to men he gave strange gifts. He willed that the hearts of men should seek beyond the world and should find no rest therein, but they should have a virtue to shape their life, amid the powers and chances of the world, beyond the music of the Aenor, which is as fate to all things else. It is one with this gift of freedom that the children of men dwell only a short space in the world alive, and are not bound to it, and depart soon, the Silmarillion, pages. 41, 42. Note the connection between, 1, the freedom in man's life and history, 2, his materiality and temporality, 3, his mortality, and, 4, his restless longing, sane sucked. Angels are, 1, transcendent to history, 2, immaterial, 3, immortal, and, 4, complete. Paradoxically, our freedom is our doom, we are doomed not only to restlessness and to death but also to freedom. Our freedom is a free doom. What doom do you bring out of the North? The doom of choice, said Aragorn, Lord of the Rings, p. 423. C. S. Lewis writes about the unpredictability of history too. About everything that can be called the philosophy of history I am a desperate skeptic. I know. Nothing of the future, not even whether there will be any future. I don't know whether the human tragicomedy is now in Act 1 or Act 5, whether our present disorders are those of infancy or old age. Section 7.4 Is there devolution as well as evolution? Throughout the Lord of the Rings, most great things, great deeds, great heroes, and great ages are in the past. Clearly Tolkien believed that his century, the twentieth, was spiritually smaller, in its virtues and even in its vices, than medieval Christendom, less heroic than the Dark Ages that produced Beowulf, and uglier than the Victorian and Edwardian eras, which Tolkien saw passing away before his eyes. The Lord of the Rings can be viewed as a mythical history of how tawdry modern ages like our own come to be. Devolution is the consequence of violating the principle of first and second things, see pages 150-51. When beauty is sacrificed for efficiency, the result is inefficiency. When men worship machines, the proper good not only of men but also of machines is sacrificed. Consider the evidence. In the past, there were few machines and many slaves, and the rich, who could afford many slaves, lived a life of leisure because of them. Today, when machines have replaced slaves, an obvious advance, those rich enough to afford the most machines do not have more leisure than they had before, but less. Leisure means time, or control over your time, that is, liberty. Machines were supposed to give liberty both to the slaves, who were no longer needed, and to the masters by maximizing their leisure. Every technological power is a power over time, a way of saving time, whether for traveling, fast cars, cooking, microwave ovens, or communicating, computers. Yet everyone complains about having less leisure, less free time than ever before. Our parents had more time for us than we have for our children, and their parents had more time for them than they had for us. Most of us spend more time paying for, learning, re-learning, cursing, servicing, updating, and playing with our computers than we save with them. 
But there is hope. After Sauron's defeat Aragorn ushers in a new golden age. Yet this is only temporary. Every victory over evil is. Aragorn's descendants gradually lose his nobility, and the pattern repeats. The pattern is free, yet it is cyclic, 1 divine blessings, 2 consequent human prosperity, 3 the fall into pride and laziness, 4 consequent decline, 5 disaster, which stirs, 6 repentance, which brings as its result, 1 divine blessings again. This is the repeated pattern of the history of Israel and the Bible, and it is the universal pattern for the history of all nations. For Israel, like Christ, is the rule as well as the exception, the key to universal history as well as the unique center of it. Whether one's personal temperament is optimistic or pessimistic, any realistic philosophy of history must account for decline. Universal optimism and the idea of universal necessary progress are simply silly. As C.S. Lewis puts it, it is, indeed, manifestly not the case that there is any law of progress in ethical, cultural, and social history, world's last night, pages. 103, 104. See also the interaction between Merlin, who is resuscitated to help modern England in her spiritually darkest hour, as some had hoped King Arthur would do with the 20th century, in Lewis's That Hideous Strength, pages. 292, 293. Section 7.5. Is human life a tragedy or a comedy? A pessimist like Tolkien can be a happy man. Both Tolkien and Lewis, who were traditionalists, conservatives, and pessimists rather than progressives, had an optimistic attitude toward ordinary life. Both lived good lives even in a purely material sense, they were able to enjoy the simple, best things in life, such as walking and weather and conversation with friends. We find the opposite connection on the part of the ideological left, between their desperately optimistic philosophy of history and their inability to admit or enjoy ordinary, earthy hobbit-like bourgeois pleasures. Indeed, no word is more despicable in the Marxist vocabulary than bourgeois. Tolkien was not an optimist by temperament but by conviction. Had he philosophized by feeling rather than faith, he would never have been able to make both halves of this statement, in 1944. I sometimes feel appalled at the thought of the sum total of human misery. If anguish were visible, almost the whole of this benighted planet would be enveloped in a dense dark vapor. But, evil labors with vast power and perpetual success, in vain, preparing always only the soil for unexpected good to sprout in, letters, number. 64, page. 76. Tolkien knows this by faith in the God who joins goodness and power in one being. But he also knows it by philosophical reason, for evil is a parasite on good, being as such is good. Therefore the more evil a thing is, the more it approaches non-being. Evil is self-destructive. Whether or not optimism is the right word for Tolkien's temperament, it is the wrong word for his philosophy. The right one is hope. The chances of history coming out well seem slim. But it happens. And it is precisely because the chances of salvation seem so slim that the victory is very precious, as Tolkien explains in On Fairy Stories. The catastrophe, or happy ending, is not only consolation but truth, if the gospel, the good news, is not a lie. From the premise that Christianity is true it follows that the far-off glimpse of joy produced by fantasy is a glimpse of truth that a great eucatastrophic tale like the Lord of the Rings is a gift of divine grace, an opening of the curtain that veils heaven to earthly eyes, a tiny telepathic contact with the mind of God. There are at least two great eucatastrophes in the Lord of the Rings. The most dramatic one is at the crack of doom. Sam and Frodo are at the end of their road, utterly hopeless and prepared to die. One of Frodo's fingers has already fallen into the crack of doom surrounded by the ring and Gollum's teeth, and the rest of Frodo and Sam are about to follow when Mount Aradru interrupts. But Frodo has completed his quest, this is his joy. As for Sam, Frodo's return from what could be called spiritual death is his joy. Sam sees Frodo pale and worn, and yet himself again. Master! cried Sam, and fell upon his knees. In all that ruin of the world, 
for the moment he felt only joy, great joy. The burden was gone. His master had been saved, he was himself again, he was free, Lord of the Rings, page. 926. It is not his physical survival afterward that is the new catastrophe. Had he died, as most epic heroes do, for example, Arthur and Beowulf, the new catastrophe would have been unmarred, just as Job would have been happy in the end even if he had not recovered his health, possessions, and family, so long as he saw God. The essential triumph is spiritual. The joy of both Frodo and Sam is pure and poignant because of their unselfish love, Sam for Frodo, Frodo for the Shire and all of Middle-earth, which he has saved. They are not winners. They are wounded and ready to die, and they have succeeded only by an incredible grace, not by force of mind or body, plans or arms. Frodo, in fact, failed, it was Gollum who completed the impossible task. The nearly miraculous outcome leaves the reader no room for pride or self-righteousness, as many happy endings do. The second new catastrophe is described more honorifically, in fact, liturgically. It resembles what we will surely experience in heaven. This comes just a little later, after the rescue. Here too it is Frodo's honor that is the source of Sam's joy. Gandalf stood before him robed in white. Well, Master Samwise, how do you feel? He said. But Sam lay back and stared with open mouth, and for a moment, between bewilderment and great joy, he could not answer. At last he gasped, Gandalf. I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A great shadow has departed, said Gandalf, and then he laughed, and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land, and as he listened the thought came to Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment, for days upon days without count. It fell on his ears like the echo of all the joys he had ever known. And he burst into tears. And then, to Sam's final and complete satisfaction and pure joy, a minstrel of Gondor stood forth, and knelt, and begged leave to sing. And behold! He said. I will sing to you of Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. And when Sam heard that, he laughed aloud for sheer delight, and he stood up and cried, O great glory and splendor! And all my wishes have come true. And then he wept. And all the host laughed and wept, and in the midst of their merriment and terrors the clear voice of the minstrel rose like silver and gold, and all men were hushed. And he sang to them, now in the elven tongue, now in the speech of the West until their hearts, wounded with sweet words, overflowed, and their joy was like swords, and they passed in thought out to regions where pain and delight flow together and tears are the very wine of blessedness, Lord of the Rings, pages. 930, 931, 933. We are that laughing and weeping host, and Tolkien is our minstrel. You catastrophe, of course, is almost the opposite of progressivism. Both are happy endings, but the first is sheer grace, while the second is necessity. We are surprised by joy and new catastrophe, while we are surprised by evil and failure if we are progressives. The locus classicus in Lewis for the refutation of progressivism is the funeral of a great myth. The myth he refutes in this essay is not just historical optimism but also the more general cosmic progressivism, evolutionism, or optimism that it exemplifies. After praising this cosmic myth of progress for its imaginative power, man, the unlikely hero, evolving from slime, outlasting dinosaurs, becoming cleverer and cleverer, let no one say we are an unimaginative age, neither the Greeks nor the Norsemen ever invented a better story, he gives its logical refutation. Noting the fatal self-contradiction which runs right through it. The myth asks me to believe that reason is simply the unforeseen and unintended byproduct of a mindless process at one stage of its endless and aimless becoming. The content of the myth thus knocks from under me the only ground on which I could possibly believe the myth to be true. If my own mind is a product of the irrational, if what seem my clearest reasonings are only the way in which a creature conditioned as I am is bound to feel, how shall I trust my mind when it tells me about evolution?
The fact that some people of scientific education cannot by any effort be taught to see the difficulty, confirms one suspicion that we here touch a radical disease in their whole style of thought. What accounts for this blind spot? Lewis goes on to explain. The basic idea of the myth, that small or chaotic or feeble things perpetually turn themselves into large, strong, ordered things, may, at first sight, seem a very odd one. We have never actually seen a pile of rubble turning itself into a house. But this odd idea commends itself to the imagination by the help of what seem to be two instances of it within everyone's knowledge. Everyone has seen individual organisms doing it. Acorns become oaks, grubs become insects, eggs become birds, every man was once an embryo. And secondly, which weighs very much in the popular mind during a machine age, everyone has seen evolution really happening in the history of machines. We all remember when locomotives were smaller and less efficient than they are now. These two apparent instances are quite enough to convince the imagination that evolution in a cosmic sense is the most natural thing in the world. But, reason cannot here agree with imagination. These apparent instances are not really instances of evolution at all. The oak comes indeed from the acorn, but then the acorn was dropped by an earlier oak. Every man begins with the union of an ovum and a spermatozoon, but the ovum and the spermatozoon came from two fully developed human beings. The modern express engine came from the rocket, but the rocket came, not from something more elementary than itself but from something much more developed and highly organized, the mind of a man, and a man of genius. Ibid, page. 90. Thank you for listening. If you like this audiobook please like, and share it and subscribe to our channel.